Welcome to the Sherry Sylvester Show. My guest today is Caroline Fairley, the Republican nominee for the Texas House in District 87, centered in Amarillo and encompassing Potter and seven surrounding counties. Caroline was in a four-person primary that included an attorney, a well-known professional businesswoman, and a member of a local school board. Still, she won on election night with 63% of the vote and is the heavy favorite to be elected in November. When she is sworn in in January 2025, she will be the youngest woman to ever serve in the Texas legislature. Despite the fact that Caroline is 25, she was endorsed by Governor Greg Abbott, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, U.S. Senator Ted Cruz, State Senator Kevin Sparks, and President Donald Trump. Caroline is a committed conservative who made securing the border a top priority during her campaign. She also promised voters that she would support parental rights so that parents can decide what is best, the best school for their child and to work to protect children from pornography in public schools. I want to talk to Caroline today about what surprised her most on the campaign trail, what other issues she's hearing about from voters that she will believe that she believes will be important next year. Caroline, welcome to the Sherry Sylvester Show. Thank you, Sherry. I'm glad to be here. Why did you run? So, um, a few things. Um, when Fort Price announced that he was no longer the going, incumbent, the House incumbent, member. yes, ma'am, was decided he was no, no longer going to seek re-election. I had a few people come to me and say, "Hey, Caroline, why do you why don't you think about running?" And from there, really, I began meeting with hundreds of people about what the job would look like. Could I do it well? And really the question I asked was, could I be effective? Like, can I do the job well and make a difference? And what it came down to um, is that it is time for conservatives from my generation to step up. I mean, the reason why I'm, I'm, I really ran was these values that we believe in, especially in the 87th district and, and where I was born and raised in the Paint Handle, we have to defend those values. And we don't want to just defend them, but we want to promote them all over Texas. Like, we would agree that living life conservatively, life is just better. And so really at the at the root of it, it took really months of thinking and, and really praying about if I should step up and lead and step aside from my business career. Um, it came down to this really simple, um, I think profound idea that conservatives from my generation, we have to step up um, for our future kids, future grandkids, and, and the future of Texas. Let's start by looking at one of your campaign ads. There was a lot of advertising in uh, the House District 87 race. Mm -hmm. A lot of money was spent on every side. Yes. So let's look at the first campaign ad. Border security, health care costs, the cost of living. These challenges impact all of us. With the dysfunction I've seen in Washington, D.C., something needs to change. Caroline Fairley for State Representative, endorsed by Governor Greg Abbott and Senator Ted Cruz. With my conservative values, experience working with Congressman Ronnie Jackson, and as a professional who negotiates lower health care costs, I will fight for you. So you talk there, and you just mentioned, uh, and I love this line, living life is better as a conservative. What are those values? What does make a difference? And do you think it's different in West Texas than it is in here in Austin, which is not even part of Texas? <laughs> I, th I think that it, I, I probably uh, agree that maybe it depends on who you're talking to in Austin, but yeah, it might be different than the, than the Texas panhandle. Um, so really, to me, what living life conservative, they're really what our founding fathers wanted our country to look like. I mean, it's individualism, capitalism, small government, cutting taxes. It's promoting faith, family values. Uh, and those are just really at the tip, a few of the things I believe what it looks like to, to really be conservative, and especially in the Texas panel. I mean, these are farmers and ranchers, and a lot of my area is rural. And these guys, they get these West Texas panhandle grit, hardworking values that, that we believe in. I know that that area has really been, uh, I mean, the, pan the panhandle wildfires up there have been terrible, and I know you were involved in that. What did you see, and what, where, how is the community doing now? So when the wildfires first hit, um, it was the first time, you know, I, I had at this point had spent four or five months campaigning all over the district, and, and I knew these people. Like, they had become my friends. And so I remember, I think it was a Monday or Tuesday night, I, I called about 70 people in the district just to say, hey, how are you doing? 
are you okay? Is your family okay? Is your land okay? And your cattle? Um, and uh, really what I heard was, one, it's just devastating. These people have invested their their lives to farming and ranching, and then it's just gone because of a wildfire. And so um, I went out to Fritch and Stinnett and, and, and brought some food and supplies to see what I could really help with. Um, and mainly uh, what's amazing is these communities in these areas, they come together and they lock arms and say, what do we need to do to work together for the Panhandle? Um, and that is something that is very unique, um, that was, I think, inspiring for other people in Texas and also just here um, in, in the Panhandle. And so those, those, those are a few things that I saw. But now, um, now I think it's how do we move forward and what are we going to do next? Um, and what are ways that we can help or the state of Texas can help to prevent next time we, we see this happen? Um, and so that's, I think, moving forward what, what we're looking at. In the campaign, which was a lot of back and forth, mm -hmm. what surprised you? So you decide is, you're going to run. You've got a, a professional job you uh, you like mm -hmm. that that's uh, cutting edge, and you decide you're going to run for office. What did you expect, and what surprised you? So, what I ex I will tell you to be totally frank. What I expected when I first announced that I was going to run, I expected people to say, "Oh my heavens, this 25 year old is running, and she looks 17." I mean, like, <laughs> what is going on? And um, and to my surprise, I, I you know I had a few people that maybe would say, oh, you know, what are we doing? But by the time we would sit down and have a meeting and talk about values and beliefs and what we want done, age was never really a problem at all. Uh -huh. Um. So that was one thing I expected that actually surprised me that wasn't as much of a big deal as I thought it would be. Um, and then the other thing that surprised me was these debates that we had. I mean, we had, I think, 10 forums and debates, <laughs> Wow, which was so so many. And they were exa they were like four hours long. They were exhausting. And um, I was really surprised at how much back and forth we had between all the opponents about attacks that were being made and and a lot of them felt like actual just debates you know rebuttals and and I was really surprised at how intense those got I wasn't expecting that um which I'm, I'm thankful for hindsight because I think it geared me up um mm -hmm. and and really allowed me to have a voice and and say this is what I really believe and think and and I can defend myself in, in a way that's effective and um can communicate well so that that was um surprising what kind of issues did you debate about I mean we tend to think state wide, it's all border. You guys are pretty far from the border. But mm -hmm. what kinds of issues came up in those debates? So the top issues were, of course, the border. Um, school choice was a huge, every form I would be asked about that. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, water, agriculture, those were the, those are probably the top three that, mm -hmm. that I was asked about. And about school choice, what was the, what does it look like in the community? Were, were people angry that it didn't pass? Were there some people really holding on? What did the debate look like so, to parents and others? Yeah. So one, I I definitely had pushback. Like when I would meet with some of these folks in these rural areas, I had a lot of pushback. They would say, hey, you know, they would phrase the question in a way that says, are you for defunding public schools? And I would say, no, of course I don't want to defund public <laughs> schools, <laughs> you know. Um, and so really what those looked like was me just explaining, let me tell you what I believe. Like, look, we have to, of course, support our public schools. But we also have to allow parents to have this fundamental conservative position to allow them to have a choice about what's best for their kids. And and oftentimes we would say, let's just take a look at the bill. Where was the bill at? Let's talk about, you know, November, December. What what did it look like? And, and by the time I would sit down and have a conversation, by the end, most of the time they would say, OK, yeah, I agree. Like no one disagrees with the position that parents should have a choice. Nobody. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was interesting to see the miscommunication that had happened when I went out to these rural areas and said, let's just sit down and have a conversation. I care about your children's education. I want them to be, you know, and have the best education they have. I want them to have good teachers. We want to support the teachers. Let's talk about the pain point with school choice. And then by the time they would explain, I was able to say, okay, let's talk about what school choice means in your area and how it's going to affect you or not affect you. And and so by the time we got to the end of it, it really wasn't a problem because they want to have a voice. They want to feel like somebody cares about their kids and their children, which is what school choice does. Mm -hmm. um, and so through sitting down with these superintendents, I mean, I was intentional to sit down with them and say, let's talk about this and, mm -hmm. and get down to it and communicate well and, and bridge the gap on the things that you have a problem with and that I'm advocating for. And, and most of the time, 
we would end on the same page about. We want our kids to have the best education. We want parents to have a choice um, in how to do it that well. So mm-hmm. it was really good. So the, f- the feeling that you got in these rural communities, is this right or wrong, is that they really do believe their state representative is their voice in state government. I'm sorry, say that they, last They part. really believe that their representative is their voice in state government. Yes. They wanted to understand what you believed. Exactly. And they wanted you to understand what they believed. Exactly. And that's the goal. I mean, as a representative, you have to, I feel like, understand the needs of your district and then also be able to then say, look, send me to Austin and I'll be a voice for you and defend the things that we believe here. And mm-hmm. and I'll stick to my values. Like when I gave my closing speech, when I won on March 5th, I said, look, I'm not going to promise what I'll do, but who I'll be. And who you're sending to Austin is someone who is is grounded in these values and beliefs and faith and makes decisions based off of those things and, and what's best for the district in, in Texas. And, and that really, I think, uh, helped in campaigning, letting them have a voice and then me being candid and upfront about this is what I believe and and um, we can work together. It's, it's a brilliant statement that you make because one of the things that is important to understand about politics that we always tell candidates is that people... Uh, are not looking for, they always say, we should campaign more on the issues. And I think most voters don't particularly care about the issues. They want someone who understands how the world looks to them and that will make judgments as they come up. I mean, there's 5,000 bills that are going to come across (laughs) your desk. Uh you can't have a position on all of them. They haven't even. They don't even exist yet. Totally. So it's, it's that was such a great thing to say. When you were campaigning, you talked about uh, you worked in Washington for mm-hmm. Congressman Ronnie Jackson, and you talked about seeing dysfunction there. And I've heard you say that a lot. I saw a lot of dysfunction. What did the dysfunction look like? <laughs> that's a loaded question. I mean, Trey. we see it from I mean... <laughs> from in, on TV, and we go, "Yep, that's dysfunction." So we knew what you meant, but I wonder what it looked like on, up close. So when I was in D.C., one, I was in D.C. when uh, Biden had just, he was taking office, so that's four years ago, um, which was a very different time than where we're at. And it was also during COVID. Uh Um, And so very shut down in D.C., but really what it was was a lot of managing and positioning and manipulation to get what you want, essentially. Uh So, and I think that might be similar in a lot of political realms, really. Um, I think it's on steroids in D.C., uh, especially considering our current president. But um, really what it was was people positioning and saying, what can I do to get something done? And and um, very deceitful, very nasty, very a lot of things like that, that stories, et cetera, that I could share, but um, mm-hmm. not beneficial for now. <laughs> You have been, I know you were at the Texas Public Policy Foundation's Policy Summit a mm-hmm. couple of weeks ago, and we had a lot of newly elected or like you, new, newly nominated people there. What are you seeing in this next generation? Because we have some big changes mm-hmm. and more big changes maybe to come after runoff. What are you seeing in this this class, the freshman class in the House, uh, that uh, that you feel good about? Uh, in terms of your new colleagues? So I'm looking forward to, I mean, we'll have a relatively pretty large class. I think we have about 15 to 17 right now. Um, And so what I'm looking at and really excited about is just new voices in the House who have new ideas and and I think really a conservative movement towards pushing the needle to these values we believe in and holding to them. Um, I've met really quite a few of them and they're all fantastic conservatives. I mean, they're fighting for justice and individualism and capitalism and they um, they believe these values, and so I'm I'm really looking forward to what it will look like in this next session with all of these new ideas and and voices and, and passions that most of them are, are rooted in mm-hmm. are really actually conservative values um, uh-huh. and not you know moderates etc. So, <laughs> you, you know, uh, our, one of the stories that you tell that I really like is your long conversation with Ted uh, with U.S. Senator Ted Cruz before he endorsed you. Mm-hmm. I wondered, are there other people? either in the past or in current politics that you kind of look up to as models or someone who inspires you or, so, or not? There's not a lot of politically people who are, <laughs> who are inspiring. That, so no, it's, a good, it's an okay answer too. Well, I'll tell you, Senator Cruz is definitely one of them. Um, I, I have really enjoyed um, watching, I will say Katie Burt has been 
inspirational. Just her age. I mean, she's 40 years old. She's the youngest woman senator. Uh-huh. It's very inspiring. Um, and she's been interesting to watch and, and just learn from because she's in that similar generation gap. Uh-huh. I mean, she's a little, she's definitely older than I am, but um, she's taking office and has never held office before. And she's a U.S. senator. So she's been someone. Um, and then um, Senator Ted Cruz has been a huge one for me, watching him lead Texas and and be able to communicate well these values. I mean, I think that's a huge thing. You said about the difference of communicating policy, but also then communicating it well. And there's a way to do that that's effective, that's inspiring, mm-hmm. that people want to follow. Um, and I, I think he does that really well. Yeah. It's interesting to me. I wanted to ask you about this. Uh, I was on a panel uh three or four weeks ago, a media panel, and it was on why uh, your generation, Generation Z, doesn't vote. And uh, the people in the panel said, you know, they, they were trying to figure out all these these uh, political reasons. Well, mm-hmm. you know, we're all liberals and Texas is controlled by conservatives, no yeah. reason to vote. And finally, one young woman just said, you know, we're, really, we're just too lazy. And, uh, and then... Uh, I subsequently read a poll that said that 40% of the people under age 29 believe they don't have enough information to vote, Hmm. that they don't understand the issue. Interesting. What do you think about Generation Z? And I mean, we, I love to, I could just tell Generation Z jokes for the next hour. (laughs) Hey, I, I won't mean, these stop are you people. Sharing. These are people who who also say that they get overwhelmed in restaurants because there's so many things on the menu. Oh, I know. It's <laughs> it is definitely. So, what a do you do group. about those stereotypes? Getting them. So, so to understand your question. You're asking about. It's not really a question. But. It's kind of a statement. I was like, it's a question yeah. statement. So, here are my thoughts. A few things about Gen Z and also just my generation in general is the voter turnout is low. I mean, in my district, the average voter voting age is like. 50 to 80. I mean, it's relatively very old. And so we've got to figure out how to get the younger folks to vote in my age range that aren't liberals. Uh Like, because the thing is, for some reason, part of my generation thinks they want socialism. I mean, they want to defund the police. They want to shut down our country and schools during COVID. And they think boys can be girls and girls can be boys. Like, (laughs) we've got to figure out how to engage the younger, um, people my age and my generation to be involved in politics. So I think part of it is they're afraid of being in politics um, for the hate or misinformation or, you know, um, being misunderstood. Uh, But the other part of it, too, I think is so interesting. I was speaking to some college students like a month ago, and they were asking questions about policy and what I believe and conservative values. And I could tell most of them were probably... Uh, more on the moderate liberal side. And we had a great candid conversation about what they believed and what I believed. And what Mm -hmm. was great about was it wasn't a fight. It wasn't an argument. It wasn't me being so aggressive that I was shoving conservative values down their throat. It said, hey, let's just talk about this. But the difference that was interesting was that I'm finding, and, and correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, but they don't know who they are or what they believe. And so they let TikTok and social media and the world tell them who they are. So then when they get thrown into the waves of it, they're like, well, I don't know, because if I say this, then I'm I'm in this camp. But if I say this, I'm in this camp. Like, um, I know a friend of mine, she has a son who is, um, he's straight, but he doesn't want to say he's straight because he doesn't want to be put in a camp because he's worried if... If he polarizes him on one side, he's offensive to the other group. And it's like, it's just no logical thinking to that. But these people my age, they've got to know who they are and what they they believe. And for me, that comes from my faith. I mean, I'll I'll tell you, and I think it may be different for someone else, and that's great. But but if you're not knowing who you are and what you really believe, and you're going to let TikTok define that, I just think it's going to be very, very confusing. And I I think we see that a lot. And and so I think that's part of it. And I, I think there's a lot of variables. But... But I am I am very optimistic about getting the next generation involved. Like, I think we are seeing um, people in their 20s and 30s who want to make a difference and make a change. Mm-hmm. And I think that's amazing. And I think that's something that we need to encourage these conservatives to step up and support them in the best way. You talk about a new generation of leadership. And you've talked about that just now. 
What does that look like to you and what issues, I mean, we know what issues are on the front burner for Texas right now, but what other issues might the new generation of leadership go after that we're not looking at? Well, I think we might be looking, I think social issues is the biggest thing. I think it's the social issues that my generation struggles with about, um, you know, whether it's abortion and saying, well, should we have exceptions because it feels wrong? Or even these college students I was talking to, they were struggling with um, the open border and saying, well, we don't want to we don't want a closed border because what about the good mom and child that wants to come over there? And I said, look, we want the good mom and child here. We want them to do it the right way. And, and really, it's two topics. It's the border and it's immigration. <laughs> and mm-hmm. and we have to secure our border and figure out who's in our country before we think about just letting anybody over. Like, that just doesn't make sense. But I think a lot of it is this, um, I think a lot of it is the social issues and mm-hmm. figuring out where do people really stand on them. And I think that goes back to social media, a lot about social media and what it's infiltrating our children and our kids and, and the younger generation. Um, I think that's kind of the, the topic, I would say. Do you, think, do you think that there that conservatives turn younger people off, particularly younger women? Because you know there's a split. The younger men tend to lean more on our side, and younger women are leaning more uh, on the uh, liberal progressive side. It, our social issues do do we seem close minded? Uh, uh, and you know on issues like. Uh, uh, gender preference, you mentioned abortion, uh, DEI programs were shutting those down, uh, and, and it seems like that they there's a really um, a misunderstanding of that. I mean, mm-hmm. really, everybody wants to expand minority recruitment and get more kids into college. Uh, we just don't, don't feel like they need to have an anti-American message exactly. to, to inspire them exactly. to do that. Exactly. Um, so uh, specifically with women, uh, you know, it's interesting that you say that because it is true. Women are for some reason on the side of a little more the moderate liberal. And I don't, to- you may have thoughts that I don't totally know why that is. Like, I don't know if it's because of, um, the, them having children that are being raised here or if it's social media. I mean, you may have some thoughts on that. I don't totally know if I know why that is. Um, I think a lot of it does have to do with, they're, um, they get on social media and they see these far, far right people who are just black and white. This is how it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's deterring to females. I think they're like, well, what if I want to have an opinion that disagrees with you? Are you going to tell me, you know, and yell in my face and tell me I'm wrong? So I, that might be some of it, just the, the messaging of it. But, um, thankfully when I campaigned, most women and females and moms were very conservative and pro all of these things that we believe in. Um, and so that may be more in the urban areas, but, and you may have some thoughts on that, but I'm not totally sure why I think why that is. Well, I hadn't thought about it until just now, but I think you did with younger women uh, on both sides. We've got the squad. Those women are very outspoken. Mm-hmm. On our side, we've got Marjorie Taylor Greene mm-hmm. and some other really loud black women who tend to see things in black mm, and white, yeah. who tend to, you know, uh, give no quarter. And I think if you're an ordinary woman trying to weigh, as you say, these are not easy issues. Abortion, no. not an easy issue. Yeah. Uh, gender identity, not we want to tolerate coming across the border. The Bible tells us to take care of strangers. Mm-hmm to be open to strangers. And so none of these issues are easy. So when you've got people who are just like going, oh, no, that's the answer to that. That's the answer to that. And if you don't think it, you're wrong. You're like, well, I don't know which side to choose. Yeah, yeah. I kind of yeah. stay home and decline to vote that day, too, you know. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it, you're right. It's interesting. It is very interesting. So what are you going to do? You've got, we've just got a few minutes here. Okay. You've got till, when's the election? November 5th? Mm-hmm. And you have an opponent. Mm-hmm. Democrat uh, opponent. But you're there you're not in a Democrat stronghold. No, thankfully. Thankfully. <laughs> so what are you going to do between now and then to get ready for uh next year? So a few things. One, I, I really want to take advantage of this time I have to set myself up as well as I can in my freshman um first session. So a few things. One, I, I'm I'm already working on, you know, is there certain legislation I want to focus on and and pass? Are there certain things I'm really passionate about that I think are important to Texas and also just my district specifically? I mean, water is huge. Um and the other thing I'm working on is just 
building relationships with these other legislators. Like I have a, a lot to learn from some of these senior members that have been in the House for 10, 20 years. Um, and so I'm looking forward to getting connect to connect with them more and figure out, okay, what do I need to do to be successful as a freshman? Um, and what are things I need to learn? And so I'm, those are a few things. And then um, still being out in the district a lot. Like I've, um, I'll, I'll, you know, pretty pretty heavily campaign again starting here the next month to get back out in the district and and still continue that relationship because what I believe will make me an effective representative for my district is having those relationships with them um, back in Amarillo and in um, Borger and Dumas um, to make sure that I know the needs that they want so I can be a, a good voice in Austin. So I'll spend the next, you know, six, seven months working all of those things, which is, it keeps me quite busy. Um, but it's been, it's been enjoyable thus far. Great. Well, great to have you. Great to have, uh, a representative from such a gorgeous part of the state, Amarillo by morning. Now we all know who you are, and we'll be watching. Thank you, Sherry, so see, much. To see how it goes. Thank you all for joining me. You can subscribe to The Sherry Sylvester Show on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. Follow me on X at Sylvester1630 and subscribe to my newsletter, Ninth in Congress, by going to the TPPF website, www.texaspolicy.com slash ninth and come.